But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now to the second passage, which is Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Did me the Lord please to help us to hear his word as we are gathered here on this uh, very special day for all of us. love to say that uh, in the Lord's goodness there is a crash uh, at the back of this building uh, to help uh, with any uh, mom or dad whose uh, child might be a bit um, needing some support or help. Uh, so uh, please feel free to use the crash. And again to say to all of us um, to be very warm and welcoming to those with young ones and for the children to be very, to try and be very still. Uh, and listen. All age services really is what is normal. What is actually slightly unusual uh, is having to ask children to leave. Um, the norm in all of church history or in much of church history is for us to stay together and to feed from the same meal. Just like you can see the episodes or even the letters that are written to the church are addressed to a people who would have been gathered. Husbands are to love their wives, but within the same letter, children are to obey their parents as is fitting in the Lord. Um, so, uh, it is good for us to be gathered in an old age service. And they were not necessarily brief, just to warn you uh, ahead of time. Uh, you know, people like Paul just kept on preaching until people fall off from the windows. Um, so I'm not giving you any indication that because it's all age, it is therefore going to be brief. I think we're just going to get the same dosage, the same content, uh, but we shall try and be uh, careful and understanding. For older children, and by older I mean any kid or any child, perhaps over the age of four, you should be, you should be able to be still. So... I will not entertain movement of any form or nature, really, um, by children over the age of four. Uh, stay still uh, for the next half an hour or so. Watch any to sikiriza neno. Sawasawa. And then we'll be able to uh, move on. In a moment here, we are going to distribute some uh, forms or some uh, M blank uh, sheets of paper, and in the course of this sermon, I'm going to give you children, I think four activities that I would love you to do. They are all questions that I would love for you to answer. So some blank uh, sheets of paper will be passed around. Uh, Chris, if you can just uh, you know, take a bunch and take round, and all the children make sure that you all get a plain sheet of paper. Uh, they will be useful. Amani, you want to help distribute? Yeah? No, you don't want to. <laughs> Okay, that's right. Um, Philip, you can, you can help distribute the papers. Uh, 
Great. Just one. Uh, yes, the younger children. Uh, the rest of us can answer the questions in our notebooks uh, when we are able to move together. What's the big idea? The big idea from the passage that was read for us is Jesus said his people with all his power to make disciples from all nations and promises them his presence. That's a big idea for today that Jesus said to his people with all of his power to make his disciples from all nations and also promises them his presence. So you notice that there is people, power, disciples, nations, and presence. Those are important key words. Just looking back before we begin delving into the passage today, I think we gathered uh, on the other older building on the 4th of June 2017. It's a bunch of us, uh, sorry, a um, bunch of us who are mainly working in the same uh, organization. We were trusting that the Lord would indeed be pleased to bring us together and that there would be planted a gospel-centered church. Among us, and even within us, there were many fears and doubts. We wondered what, would go, what is going to happen. We wondered whether the work would actually take off or it might actually crumble. We wondered whether we would have the resources to sustain it. Earlier on, we had even wondered about the venue where we are going to be gathering. We very much want, knew what we wanted to do to plant a church, but we didn't know how. Even now, we still haven't quite figured out so many things. Even when we have a kind of a, an appeal, a fundraising for development, we are not sure how to do that. We don't know whether we place the table in the middle or on the side. Whether we fill the form digitally or we fill a piece of paper. We're not sure whether queuing up is a good thing or whether somebody should be announcing what has been given the old school Harambe style. There's so many things that we needed to figure out and we still are figuring out even now. But today we look back with gratitude for those, uh, at those seven years. And we can say, as uh, Elder Jeff did and read for us in that passage in 1 Samuel 7, 12, this far the Lord has brought us. The Lord has helped us. The Lord has kept us grounded in the gospel. It has placed the Lord also to add to our numbers, those that the Lord has brought our way. It has placed the Lord to help us to plant two other churches. It has placed the Lord to help us to establish a school in order to serve our immediate community. It has pleased the Lord to help us to have a mercy ministry program to continue serving those among us with practical needs. There are so many things the Lord has done among us. So many children have been born among us. So many weddings. Uh, in the Lord's goodness, we have joined more than 35 weddings just uh, in the last seven years. Looks like it's an average of five a year. The Lord has been good and gracious. The number of children perhaps um, are perhaps in, within the same range or even more. The Lord has been good and gracious to us. It has not been without challenges. There have been many challenges and there still are. Financial challenges have been very real to us. Relational challenges. Because this community of believers, just like any other community, is a bunch of sinners whom the Lord has forgiven, but who are still struggling with sin. And so we have had relational difficulties. We have had tenuous moments, even in our mem membership meetings. We have had doctrinal questions to deal with. We are still grappling with the questions of structure. Yet, in all these things, our good and gracious Father has been together with us through it all. 
And so we can collectively say those words that uh, Elder Jeff read, read for us. Thus far, the Lord has been with us or has helped us. We pray that this continues, that the Lord continues to hold our hands in the future. Brothers and sisters, we are still small and weak and certainly in need of God's help. We pray that the Lord is going to be together with us for years to come. And so we are going to go back on this service to those commissioning words that Jesus spoke to his disciples in Matthew 28 to reflect very briefly how Jesus sent his people with his power to preach his whole gospel to his whole world and assured them of his presence. Let us pray then as we come to God's word. Father God, please speak to us. Lord, help us, even amidst um, potential distractions and uh, amidst many thoughts racing in our minds, many fears and anxieties, please help us to pause and to reflect on your faithfulness. Help us to stop and think about the nature of our mission, of the mission that you have called us to. Please help us as we delve into these words, to hear what exactly you are saying to us. And help me, Lord, to be clear, to be faithful, to be consistent, to the honor and glory of your name and for our joy and good in the Lord Jesus Christ. For we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Listen to these words again. They are only so brief. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold... I am with you always to the end of the age. What lessons then can we learn? Or what is Jesus really saying in these closing words of Matthew's gospel? I think we will notice that there are at least five things, there could be more, that we can take away. Here is the first one. The first one is that Jesus sends all of his people. And we notice that in verse 16, but also in verse 19, part A. Verse 16 says that the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And then in 19, it says, Go, therefore, ama kwa kiswahiri, enendeni basi. You see, what Matthew is doing in these passages, he's giving us a glimpse of the people that were with Jesus at this time when he is giving this commissioning. They are back in Galilee. We are told it's the 11 disciples and they are back in Galilee. Remember the resurrection had happened in Jerusalem. The context of this passage is that soon after the resurrection, then you get the great commissioning. So the resurrection had happened in Jerusalem where Jesus had then risen from the dead. But now he had told them to meet him in Galilee, up in the north, about 150 kilometers north. And there was a particular mountain, the Mount of Olives, where they were to gather. Then we are told there is this 11 of them. Uh, there is only 11 of them. One of them had betrayed Jesus and had taken his own life, Judas. And so he was not together with them. But you have these 11 and verse 17 says something that's quite striking, that when they see Jesus, this 11, is that they worshipped him, meaning that they recognize that he is God, but we are also told some of them doubted. Some of them doubted. And yet, we will notice that in verse 19, Jesus is going to commission all these people, both those who are worshipping him and even those who are doubting. Let me take a note of something that um, perhaps you may have noticed also just from the plain reading of that passage. Do you notice that here 
names and numbers are not the main thing. We are not told the names of the 11 who are with Jesus. You would have thought this is a very important moment. Jesus is about to commission really his church to go on a mission. And so you would imagine it is very important for us to take note who was there. But the names are not given. Which is quite striking because Matthew started with his gospel in chapter 1 with a long list of names of people um, that were in the genealogy of Jesus. But now, as the new kingdom is beginning, that which indeed will be built upon the preaching of these 11 men, their names, at least here, do not matter. There is only one name that's actually mentioned here that really matters, and it is the name of God. We see the name of Jesus, and then later on we're going to see that the baptism is to be done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But as to the names of the 11 who are there, they are not mentioned. Their impact will be great later on as they go out preaching, but it is not their name or their fame that really matters. Think about that in a church planting situation. I think we can easily be tempted to sort of want our name and our legacy to appear in the books of history. We might be those who might be even be tempted to say that we were there when the church was not even five, seven, or even ten years old. Not so. Matthew doesn't give us the names of these people. We can probably tell they were the disciples. And we can perhaps look at the list elsewhere. But on this particular occasion, the names do not matter. The one name that truly matters is the name of Jesus. I pray that our hearts may be drawn towards glorifying Jesus. The theme of this celebration today is, All glory be to Christ. And our prayer then, as the elders and as the leaders of this church, is that indeed may all glory be to Jesus. Not to the 10 or 2 or 14 who gathered whatever they did for the thinking about and the processing about this local church. But may all glory be to Jesus. But can I move on and make another observation for us here? There are people, or there were people in this company of the 11 who were doubting. We are told they worshipped him in verse 17, but some doubted. Some were not very sure. But it's also quite striking to notice that even though they were doubters, or there were people who were not very sure, about this whole resurrection thing, they had trekked 150 kilometers to go where Jesus had told them to go. Yes, they were doubters, but they were obedient doubters. These are people who could only be driven by their love for Jesus, by their love for the Lord, and yet... They had not been very sure about this resurrection story. Friends, can I suggest to us, even as I make this second observation here, that doubters are welcome in Jesus' work. There are those who are not very sure where is this going. Yet, they are welcome in Jesus' company. As they go along, and as they continue spending more and more time with him, things become clearer and clearer. And friends, even as we think about this um, um, occasion today, or even the many other occasions where we might be invited to participate, maybe in a gospel project, we will not always be sure what God is doing. But our role is to be those who are obedient. We might not have the full picture. Of how will this turn out? How will Grace Point Church be 70 years from now or 100 years when none of us is going to be here? 
We may not have a clear roadmap of how everything is going to pan out. But ours is to obey. Look at these men who were doubting and yet they trekked the distance from here to Nakuru to go and be where Jesus had commanded his people to gather. Then what's the call for us there? It is to be those who are obedient. Not always sure, but certainly obedient to the Lord. Can I then suggest, even among us, in our numbers today, there are those who are not sure. There are those who are doubting. They're not too sure, even about the theology here. They're not too convinced about certain things. We will need patience one with another because not everyone is on the same page. We will need to love one another more and more because that's how other people are going to know that we surely are the Lord's disciples. One last observation before I move on um, from this first point and say, you will notice that the sending, the English doesn't help us here, but the Swahili does, the sending is Puro. The sending here is not, go you therefore. The English tries to help it and puts it like, go ye, because it is puro. You see the word go in English, you can't tell whether it is go to a single person or to one, to one person or to a group of people. The right translation, however, is go ye, enendeni, which is a Swahili word, nini, mkiwa wengi. Which means that the sending here, we would notice in verse 19, is puro. God is sending these people together as a team. And I'd love to say then, mission, church planting, in it of God's work is never a personal enterprise, but it is indeed a communal responsibility for of us. We all have a role to play. This is not my mission and ministry here, or Pastor Fidel, or any of the elders. It's actually for all of us, we have all been sent together to reach this township for Jesus. In other words, you have not come today to be an onlooker at Harrison or Pastor Fidel's ministry. Indeed, we have all come together to be fed and to be equipped with the word so that we can all go out there and do ministry. We did that in Ephesians chapter 4. It's one of those taglines that we have used in the past many times that we want to embrace every member ministry. Because every one of us has a role to play. I've often used that illustration many times that there is a church that have these words on their exit door. The service is over. Now go and worship. In other words, then, we are to live for Jesus. And it ought to be even more so when we are out there in the world, in the marketplace, in our places of work, in our commute, and wherever else the Lord has positioned us. It also means that when we are gathered, none of us is an onlooker. We are to serve. We come to roll up our sleeves. No one is here to say, let me look for the best spot, the most vantage position in the hall so that I can see action happening at the front. None among us says, no, let me sit back and look at how the music team is going to perform or the media team and how they're going to cue the clip or even the slides. Each of us is invited as a participant. None among us is a spectator. We are all to be players. We are all to be involved. There is no such a ministry as backbenching. There is also no secret service in Jesus' kingdom. All of us are involved in the trenches. We are all to be involved, whether that will mean in hospitality, whether that will mean in generosity, whether that will mean in teaching, like I'm doing this morning, or teaching children that uh, many of you do another, su another Sundays, all of us then have a role to play. 
na maombi yangu ni kuwa isiwe kuna yeyote kati yetu ambaye ameingia kati yetu kutafuta kingine eh, au mwingine isipokuwa Yesu natumaini ya kuwa hakuna mmoja kati yetu ambaye amekuja shopping labda ametafuta community ama anatafuta mpenzi ama anatafuta marafiki kwa maana labda utakosa na hata ukikosa yawezekana kuwa hautakaa hautaingia ndani na ukipata pia hautakaa kwa sababu kunacho kile kilikuwa kimekuleta I pray that we are here to fight Jesus naomba kuwa Yesu Kristo mwenyewe aweze kututosheleza maishani mwetu injili yake na ikatuingie kwa udani sana kwa maana sote tumeitu na tumealikwa kumtumikia Yesu katika ijiri yake So here is the first question the question first for adults and then activity for the children What motivates you here You may put it in your notebook or even in your note one on, on your phone Why are you here Na sitaki majibu unieleze lakini nakuuliza tu Why are you here What brings you here Sunday after Sunday? Why have you been here the last seven years? For quite a number of us, we've been coming along seven years. Others of you five, others six, others three, and others just joined in recently. But why are you here? Why did you drive past so many other groups of people? Na ukaja hapa. Ni nini imekuleta hapa? Ni rafiki? Ni matumaini fulani? ama watafuta ijiri wa mtumainia na kumtamani Yesu mwenyewe what motivates you what brings you here and for the children here is your first activity and i think it's up on the screen please write down today's big idea tutamak baadaye write down the big idea tulisema nini mwanzoni you can write it down in your piece of paper But let's move to the second point that Jesus commissions his people to go with all his power. We find that in verse 18. Look at verse 18 once again. And Jesus came and said to them, "All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me." That's an amazing statement for Jesus to make. Oh all authority in heaven and on earth in all known universe the authority has been given to Jesus this means that Jesus has all power everywhere at all times Jesus now who is risen from the dead has absolute power over everything and everyone everywhere and at all times Everyone is then subject to him whether they are spiritual powers or people or governments or authorities or even demons everything is subject to Jesus' power There is no one there is no place at any time that is not under his power and authority And if he has all the power then that means he also has all the resources at his disposal. In other words, all you need for mission is made available. Sometimes you can see how children act when they have been sent to go and fetch something. Nimeambiwa unipatie labda kitu fulani. Nimeambiwa unipatie fruit, nimeambiwa unipatie funguo furani, nimeambiwa unipatie kitu kama hiyo. The power beneath those words is the authority of who has spoken them. And so Jesus has all the power and authority belongs to him. What does that then mean? Well, what it means is just in the following verse 19, verse 1. It means therefore Go. 
all power, all authority, all the resources have been given to Jesus. And now he sends you and says, therefore, go. Let me ask you, what would you do differently if you knew that your Lord has all the resources and all the capacity that you need for mission? You would stop thinking that in a limited way and think possibly, possibility. You would think, I will now go with confidence because the one who is sending me has all the power. What that also means is that you can walk up to anyone. Can I tell you about Jesus? It also means that you, you can go to plant churches anywhere. Why? Because Jesus has all the power. Even in a difficult township like Kikuyu. Even in a difficult place like the Comoros Island. Even in an unreached people context, perhaps like Laisamis, where Brother Martin is. Now we know that power is not in me. It's not in my name. It's not in my learning or lack thereof. But it is in Jesus. Therefore, I can go. I can talk to anyone. I can tell about Jesus to anyone that I meet. In other words, it does not depend on me, but on the Lord who has all authority. What's the implication for this then? It is a call to courage. Some have said maybe we are too courageous. Some even have doubted our confidence in planting churches when we ourselves can barely walk. But where is that confidence? Where do we get that? It's not a personality issue. It really is knowing the one who has commissioned us to go. When we were praying for the Mashoas last Christmas, uh, before they headed back, I think last, um, last year in April, before they headed back to go to the Comoros, one of the things you know, that was happening in my own heart is we are now sending a couple together with their child to go into a risky situation. Why would we take that kind of a risk and take responsibility for them while they are out there in the field? It is because of knowing it does not depend on us or on our numbers or on our financial capacity, which we know is quite small, but on the Lord who, is, who has all the power and authority. Therefore, because of that, we can be confident about the future because Jesus has all the power. He is the second question for you adults. What do you rely on when you think about God's mission? Who do you rely on? Do you rely on the mission agency? Do we rely on our knowledge and theological understanding and clarity? Do we rely on our numbers as a church? Where is our power? Where is our strength? Where is our authority? Is it in ourselves or in the charisma of the leaders? The oomph with which they speak? Or even the clarity of their teaching? Or is it on Jesus who has all power and authority? And here's an activity for the children. An activity for you. I hope you finish the first one to write down the big idea of today's sermon. But here's your second activity. Could you please write down the names of the 11 disciples who are with Jesus at this point? Because their names were not there, like I said earlier on. I hope that you've been learning the names of the twelve. And now accept Judas. Could you write that down? In your plain paper? Let's move to the third point. What were they to do? What was their mission? We see this in verse 19 and 20a. 
Jesus now makes his mission very clear. And I think this is important for us to understand our aboutness. Why are we here? If you struggled with that question earlier on, adults, then here you probably have an answer. What's our mission? He makes the mission very clear. They are to make disciples. Not their own disciples, but disciples of Jesus. They were to call others to follow Jesus. Not to follow them, the apostles or the disciples themselves, but actually to follow Christ. How are they to do that? By preaching the gospel, that is teaching all that Jesus had commanded, but also by baptizing those then who would believe in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's quite striking um, to, to listen to what Jesus once done. What is our mission then? It is to call others to Jesus. This is the mission of the church. And we normally say the mission of the church is missions. We exist not to build a name around ourselves or to build a legacy after anyone. But the purpose of our existence is that Jesus may be known and loved and worshipped. I know we use the terms here that we are a gospel-centered community. And what that means is that at the heart of this community, at the heart of this church, ought to be the gospel. That is all that Jesus commanded. If Jesus did not command it or teach it or do it, then it ought not to be part of who we are or of what we do. Ours is to call people to Jesus. We are here and we are raw about Christ. We are not about you. And this might sound rude to you, particularly coming from your pastor. But we are not here about you. This is not about me. It is not about any of the elders. We love children. But listen to me, little kids. This is not about you. No, we live in a time when children can overtake our attention. Everything we do, children can consume us. We have to make them the center of our attention. Listen to me, children, including my own. This is not about you. You're not the center of the show here. Neither am I or any of the elders. This is about Jesus. Yes, we will serve one another in helpful ways. Yes, we will long for and care for one another. But at the heart of this is the gospel. It is Jesus. That's what we want to do to make followers of Jesus. We're not calling people after ourselves, but after Christ. Not to baptize them in our preferred name or format, but actually to have, to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Not in our name, not in the name of Grace Point, not in our preferred or chosen format, but in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray that we will be clear as we keep going that this is about Jesus and I pray that we as pastors and leaders will continue to diminish in stature. That we may embrace insignificance and invisibility. We don't want a time when everyone thinks Grace Point, they think Pastor Fidel or Harrison or any of the other elders. And may we decrease, brothers, that Christ may be exalted. Christ may be seen more and more. May the Lord help us that we may grow in gospel centrality. It's all about Christ, all about Christ, all about Christ. No heroes, no big names around here. No name building or legacy building. We are a community called out on a mission. 
to point others to Jesus. To teach all that he commanded, including the offensive things. Because Jesus did teach very difficult and very offensive, culturally offensive things. But that's what he taught. And we don't invent. We are not creatives. We are obedient folks and we are called to be obedient brothers and sisters. Not to innovate. But actually to obey. To walk in obedience to our Lord. The generator has gone off so my voice will also come down a little bit. So here's a question then for you. That if we are then to reach all people and point them to Jesus... Here's a question for you adults. Who might we have excluded in our discipleship? Who are we not reaching? We've been given all authority. Go and make disciples. Where are we faltering? Where is our emphasis? Is it in discipleship? Where are we struggling? Who might we not be reaching? Are we investing time to disciple young ones, old ones? Those who might not speak the same language as us? Are we stretching so we can reach them? Who might we have excluded in our discipleship? It's an important question for of us to ponder. But here is also an activity for children. The third one. Could you think of five names of people that you'll be praying for that they may know and follow Jesus? They might be friends at school. Or they might be people you know. You can also ask the help of your mom or dad who might be seated next to you. They might be your relatives. They might be your cousins who are not believers. But could you please down, write down some five names of people that you will be praying for so that they can know and follow Jesus. Here's the second last one. Verse 19b talks of all the nations. It's quite striking that Jesus commands his disciples to make disciples from all the world. He says, go therefore Make disciples of all nations. The word nations here being translated to tribe or people groups. Jesus' followers are to be drawn and called from every nation on earth or from every people group. After all, all the nations are his. In the opening psalm, did allude to that. And many other Psalms, like Psalm 2, Psalm 24, Psalm 95, they all speak that the nations belong to the Lord. And all the peoples on earth need to hear the good news of our salvation. All the people on earth matter to the Lord. And they all need to hear the gospel. And the way this will be done is through proclamation when people go out and proclaim the good news, but also through planting of healthy churches. You see, the Great Commission really cannot be obeyed outside of the context of a local church. Because there is a teaching of all that Jesus commanded, but there is also the baptizing, which is an ordinance that only a local church should actually be doing. So church planting is a natural or the obvious outcome of gospel proclamation. And we see that pattern in the book of Acts. When they proclaim the gospel, churches are planted. He used to be one of those who doubted, why should more churches be planted? I approached the idea of church planting from a logical point of view or from a critical point of view. And it's a difficult one to answer if you come at it from that angle. But when you see that true obedience will lead to new communities of faith, that gospel proclamation 
leads to the planting of churches. Planting of churches leads to even more gospel proclamation. And more gospel proclamation leads to even more churches being planted. And our prayer then is that the Lord may be pleased to use us, perhaps in a small or a big way, to reach the nations for Christ. I wonder how many of you ever go to that corner and look at our missions board and think about all those nations of the world and begin to pray. I wonder how many of us have a burden for any nation of this world. I think it is very easy to be consumed by our own Kenya. Tuko na shida mingi, tuko na taxes za kulipa, tuko na, you know, um, flooding, boy imekuwa ikiendelea. And so we are wondering, you know, what, 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 when do we get the time to think about Nepal? When do we get the time to think about the Oromia region in Ethiopia? We can be consumed by our own existence. I think we need to hear that the gospel is to go to all nations of the world. Praise be to God that every first Sunday of the month, we have an opportunity to pray a prayer that focuses on world missions. But maybe more needs to be done. When that prayer meeting was not part of the service, hamukuwa munakuja, nini watu wa mungu. Hamukuwa munabaki, atituwambe mataifa. Kwa hivyo hata kwa sasa, munawambe mataifa kwa sababu imefanyo program ya kanisa. Na hata ikawa labda tunapokea zile updates on a regular basis, tunazipokea pale kwa WhatsApp. I wonder how many of you really have a burden Sidai kuwauliza muinue mikono, lakini tumekua tukiwambea the Oromia region in uh, Ethiopia. Lakini nauliza ni wangapi wamekua kiwamba kwa waminifu kwa ajili ya um, hao watu. Ni wangapi wanaomba in a disinterested way, casually. Hivo hivo, kwa sababu hauna baden, hauna muzigo. Ni program tu iko kanisani, lakini wewe kukoli hauna mzigo wa mataifa. May the Lord revive us. Pastor Fido did allude to that. To be those who love the nations of the world. To be those who think deeply about our role for the nations. The Lord has given us partnerships in places like Senegal. We need to be praying interestedly for Senegal. DRC, we have connections there. Southern Sudan, we have connections there. We have people, even right here in this congregation who are here today, who come from such nations. And we need to be praying for gospel advance in these nations. Here's a question for you adults as I move to the last point. Which nation or people group are you particularly drawn to pray for? Nani unaombea? Kiangaria timeline yako kwa YouTube, which nations do you research about or do you want to watch vid videos or documentaries about? Which missionaries do you pray for? Is that the Comoros? Which is the capital of Comoros, by the way? Now, what is that? Where are our missionaries? Which one is the capital city? Namdo mesema mayote mahali. We can be consumed with our lives. And I'm rebuked as you are, brothers and sisters. We really don't care what goes on out there. May the Lord help us to repent. And like Jesus' people, listen to these words. That the gospel is to go to all nations. Here's an activity for you children. Children, please write down names of maybe five countries that I would love for you to be praying for. Think of five countries. Maybe, maybe they might be countries you would love to go. Maybe they are countries that have not yet heard the gospel. Maybe they are countries whose goods you are consuming like China. Maybe they are countries that are dominated by other religions and Jesus is not known and loved and worshipped there. Maybe there are countries where the churches are not planted like we have been able to plant here in Kikuyu or where there is no freedom or where there is persecution. Five countries. 
that you would be praying for. He is the last and the closing point of Jesus' commission. We noticed from our theme sentence for today, or the big idea, is that Jesus sends his people with all his power, for the children who missed this, to make his disciples from all nations and promises them his presence. And this is the comforting news to all of us who are here today. Jesus promises his presence. Now you see, this work would be hard and difficult. Indeed, almost impossible. But we have these closing words that are very heartwarming. And Matthew chooses to use these words as his closing words for his gospel. He says, Behold, I am with you to the end of the age. Quite, quite striking that Jesus promises to be with his people. If you love um, an interesting connection is that there is a very interesting connection that Jesus, Matthew opens his gospel with a promise of God's presence in Matthew 1, 23, where he said, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That was chapter 1, verse 23. And now the very last verse of his gospel in the last chapter, in 28, he says, Behold, there's two beholds there. Behold, I am with you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This must have brought a lot of encouragement to the disciples. You see, the task ahead of them was enormous. They have a whole world to reach before them. They have a message that is not very popular. This same message has just made their Jesus to be killed. The message is not very popular. In fact, Paul calls it foolishness to those who do not believe. But they also have their own problems to deal with. They have a hostile culture that will soon be persecuting them. How will this be? Well, the Lord promises them this reassurance, I will be with you. Nitakuwa nani hadi mwisho wa dahari. Because of that, now you can face persecutions. Because of that, now you can face any threat that may come your way. What a beautiful thing to know. That this commission then is wrapped up in God's power and God's presence. Now you can face any challenge and any threat that may come your way. Because God's presence, Emmanuel, is with you. Let's apply this truth and say that the Lord promised to be together with his people. Because his presence then makes all the difference. It's not the presence of people that makes all the difference. It is the presence of Jesus. What will keep this church going is not the numbers. It's not the growing or the growth in giving, good as those things may be. Neither is it the expansion of the staff team. The essential thing that is needed, I might call it a thing, or the essential requirement that we have or we need for the coming 70, 700 years, is the presence of God. That's what we need. That the Lord would go together with us. If the Lord be on our side, then these children can be raised to love the Lord. The culture is hostile. It always was, has always been, would always be to the gospel. But we can raise these children to love Jesus. We can point them to the Lord. Why? His presence is with us. Things are going to be tough. They have been tough these seven years. But if the Lord is with us, this is doable. 
we plant elsewhere? Only if the Lord is with us. Will the generations to come see the hundred anniversary? Only if the Lord is together with us. Will we send missionaries? Well, on what budget? Dear brothers and sisters from this not very well, the continent. Are we going to send missionaries elsewhere to reach the rest of the world? Only if the Lord is together with us. The Lord's presence means that his grace and his goodness, his provision is together with us. And that emboldens us, gives us a spring in our step to march on ahead with confidence and assurance that the Lord God is together with us. What more could we ask for? Couldn't we sing, perhaps together with Reuben, Enda Nasi? Couldn't we ask the Lord collectively? Usipo Enda Nasi, hatutaki kutoka mahali hapa. Toomba uwepo wako na ukaweze kuenenda Nasi. Ukaamba tana Nasi. Utuongoze through the thick and the thin. Through the difficulties that we have to navigate through. May the presence of the Lord go together with us. Here's the last question for you adults. How can we keep in step with the Lord's presence? How can we? How can we? How can we stop from drifting away from the Lord's presence into other things? But here's an activity for the children, the last one before I pray. Complete this sentence. Therefore, go. And parents, you can mark this one for me. Therefore, go. It's in verse 19 of the passage we were looking at. What did we learn then today? We learn that Jesus sends his people with all his power to make disciples for him, to make his disciples from all nations and promises them his presence. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for these words that we're hearing today. Thank you that you have sent your church with all your power. Thank you that you have given us everything we need for life and for godliness. Thank you for the clarity with which you tell us what our mission really is to make disciples. Please help us to know and to learn that this is really not about us. It's all about you. Please forgive us for when we have attempted to shine the spotlight on ourselves or to imagine that this is really about us and our name and our structures and our hymns and our worship styles. Help us, Lord, so to diminish, to decrease as it were, that Christ might increase. Grant that, Lord, our focus and our attention will only be one singular focus, the Lord Jesus Christ and his glory. Please help us to be those who are obedient, even when we are doubting, even when we are not sure. Lord, where are you leading us? Please help us to be those who are obedient, to be those who are trusting that you mean well, to be those who trust that you've got these in your hands, to be those who trust that this is your church and you said you will build your church and that the gates of hell will not prevail against her. Please help us so to know that you will hold us fast. It's not so much the elders holding us fast or tradition or our history, but that you will hold us fast. You will keep us going. You will sustain us into the future unknown to us as it may be. Thank you, Lord, for your presence among us these last seven years. We give you the glory. Indeed, we give you the praise. We give you thanks for what you have done among us. May your name be praised and glorified. All these things we pray in Jesus' name.